Hello and welcome back to my kitchen. Um, my name is Dr. James Gill and you've joined me for another deep dive clinical skills video. Today we're going to look at the whys and wherefores of the abdominal examination. What it is that you're looking for at each step of the examination and how it is that we're performing particular um, examination techniques to elicit certain clinical signs. So, um, hopefully we'll be able to put a few of your questions from the abdominal video demonstration to bed and we're going to be addressing that what seems to have been a thorny discussion point about when exactly you should be auscultating during the examination. Today we've got a brand new, still in its wrapping, um, copy of McLeod Clinical Examination. And I'm hoping that you'll be joining me throughout this um, video, particularly on the premiere that we're doing. And we're going to be putting some questions out there to yourselves. And basically we're going to tot it up at the end. And every right answer um, will get a chance to win this book. And we'll work out who needs it and we'll send it wherever it goes. So something to stay all the way to the end for there. So with that out of the way, let's kick off dealing with the abdominal examination. So as with any examination, the first thing that we need to do is observe the patient. And that's particularly important here because when we're dealing with an abdominal examination, there's every possibility that we might have problems with nutrition. So we may see a slightly different appearance in that patient compared to other conditions. Is the patient looking a little bit jaundiced? Are they slightly yellow? Um, are they cachectic? So clinically um, you know, malnourished that we can see they've lost significant amounts of weight such that we'd worry about them. Are they on the other scale? Are they obese? Or are they carrying a lot of extra weight that's related to fluid if they've got something like ascites, for example? Are they well kempt? Do they have any odours about them? And is there any possibility that maybe, you know, substance misuse? Can we smell marijuana, and alcohol, cigarettes on the patient? All of which we may be having an interplay here on what's brought them to our examination room. With the initial review out of the way, we want to start off with the patient's hands. And I think you're seeing a theme now on the clinical examinations we do. The hands are an amazing um, portal into what else is going on in the body. And the abdominal examination has a, a cornucopia of signs that we can pick up that's going to direct us to problems going on with the GI system. One particularly uh, prominent example may be palm erythema, having your palm turning bright red. Now, we see this in pregnant ladies. About 30% of pregnant ladies will get this palm erythema and that's because of high estrogen states. Now we'll also see the same palm erythema in patients with liver failure because the liver is there to break down waste products or excess products for that matter. And if in a patient their liver is failing, they're not going to be able to clear any amount of estrogen that they may have. So similarly, we may end up with palm erythema in a patient with um, liver failure. We can also see palma erythema in obese patients sometimes because adipose tissue can produce estrogen of its own right. But moving away from um, the liver for a moment, we'll also see palma erythema in thyrotoxicosis. So if we think back to our thyroid videos, we know that the thyroid acts as the, the accelerator for the body. So if you've got a hyperthyroidism, a thyrotoxicosis, your system's in overdrive. As a result, we're going to get peripheral blood vessel dilation, which may cause our palmar erythema there. In all the main medical examinations you do, cardiac, abdominal, respiratory, thyroid, we're always looking for clubbing. We're getting the uh, patient to put their fingers together like so to see if they've got uh, the loss of the nail fold angle. In the abdominal examination, clubbing could indicate inflammatory bowel disease, so that being ulcerative colitis and Crohn's. It may comment about the presence of a malabsorptive problem, such as celiac. We could also have issues quite commonly with fibrosis of the liver. And if we're going to try and squeeze a point, maybe issues with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma 
as well. As well as clubbing of the nails, we can get two other features uh, that we may see. One being leukinechia, white nails. Now this comes up quite often in uh, examinations of medical students because we've all probably had, I mean I've got one there, we've all probably had partial leukinechia. And the commonest cause of this is simply trauma, you know, you banged your hand on something. We don't know a lot about leukinechia, particularly when it comes to partial leukinechia. So we largely reassure patients with that. But we can have people that have completely white nails, total leukinechia. And we do know that seems to be associated with low protein states. But again, an actual causative factor and a process does elude us at the moment, medically speaking. Another big feature that we can see is spoon shaping of the nails, coilonechia. This is seen in an iron deficiency anemia. So there we might be thinking, is it losses? So we've got Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis where the patient is losing a lot of blood. Is it a celiac problem where we're having difficulty absorbing it? Or is it simply dietary? The patient isn't taking enough in to satisfy their uh, you know, metabolic requirements. One of the final things that we'll look for in the hand is Dupuytren's contracture, where we get thickening of the palmar fascia, pulling down the little and ring fingers. Now, we can treat this surgically, so we can release this contraction, and we can also do injections to dissolve that tight tissue, allowing us to open the fingers up again. Now, we're all aware of Bill Nye. He's quite a famous British actor, and one of my favourites, certainly. If you look at any of his publicity photographs, he's normally pulling very you know, cool um, type poses, etc. Now, that's not simply because he's Bill Nye, which is a, the definition of cool in itself, but he also, if you look very closely, his classic poses aren't of choice. He has Jupiter's contracture, and his little and ring fingers are fixed and don't move. Have a look at him in some of the films, and you'll see he's completely unable to move those fingers. And given he's been like that for many, many years now, it's likely that joints have arthrodesed, fused, so even if he did have it surgically released, he probably wouldn't get much movement back in his fingers. Now, what causes Dupuytren's contracture? A little bit like leukinechia, we don't have an absolute. There does seem to be an association with alcohol. There certainly seems to be a genetic factor that it's more common in men, and there seems to be an age component too, with it being more common after the age of 50. But one area I'm particularly interested about is there seems to be an ancestral component to it. If you look at the UK, Dupuytren's is particularly prevalent on the eastern seaboard. And we know that Dupuytren's contracture tends to be more prevalent in northern Europeans. And certainly in our history, um, you know, we had plenty of visitations from the Northern Europeans down that coastline and maybe they left some of their genetic material behind, shall we say. Now, I'm not saying that Bill Nye is descended from Vikings, you know, he, lived, he was born in Surrey after all, but it's an interesting thing to consider and certainly helps me keep in mind the things that I need to look for during the examinations that I'm doing. So, having looked over the hands, we can move backwards a little bit more toward the arm and we need to check for something called an asterixis. So with the thyroid examination, we've checked for a fine tremor, but here we're getting the patient to cock their wrists back. And as arms outstretched, we may see a beating tremor. This asterixis can be symmetrical or it can be asymmetrical. What we know is that this is in a liver disease patient, it's due to hepatic encephalopathy. We've got high levels of ammonia have built up because the liver is unable to break it down, resulting in uh, issues with the movement centres of the brain. We can also see this when uh, we have a build-up of urea in renal patients as well. So if you see this tremor type movement, you know, we really uh, you know, understand that that patient is very sick and needs to be treated quite rapidly. There's also another condition that can cause uh, this asterixis, and that's Wilson's disease, uh, where we get a high buildup of copper, which we'll come back to in just a moment. After having looked at um, the um, hands, we want to check the pulse, um, both the rate and rhythm of the radius, and then going up to the antecubital fossa to check the character. 
We'll also do the blood pressure, which is particularly important in an abdominal examination. As for example, if you have hyperalbuminemia, if you have low levels of protein, that may mean that there is a reduction in oncotic pressure. What this means is that we can get fluid leaking from the, um, the vessels into the surrounding tissues, meaning somebody can have low blood pressure as a result. Carrying on from the blood pressure, because I'm a bare, very simple brain, I like to keep things in a straight line, or as close as I can get. So I'm going to go up the arm to the head and then back down. So we want to have a look at the face, and it's a general observation. How does the patient look? Do they look pale? Do they look withdrawn? Do they look very thin and skinny, like they're losing weight? Do they, crucially, look jaundiced? Now, we may see changes in the skin. However, because jaundice can be quite subtle, the first place that we are going to see a clinical change is in the sclera of the eyes. So we can get the patient to look down for us as we pull their eyelids up, and we can have a look at the sclera on top and see if there's any yellowing there, which may indicate that there is a jaundice issue here. We then also want to get, pull their eyelids down and get them to look up so we could have a look at the conjunctiva to see if there's any signs of anemia. Whilst we're looking directly at the patient's eyes, we want to have a look at the cornea. We may see a ring around the cornea. It could be pale, perhaps suggesting a high level of cholesterol. Or, going back to our asterixis point about Wilson's disease, we may have, and there's a wonderful word here, Kaiser Fleischer rings, where we get copper deposits around the cornea, which flash up if you use a slit lamp. And those high levels of copper can build up and cause issues again in the brain, resulting once more in the asterixis sign that we would see early on. So from the eyes, we want to carry on downwards. We want to have a look at the mouth. Now, I understand in our demonstration video, we were wearing masks to protect ourselves because of COVID risk. However, when we finally put this pandemic to rest, it's still going to be very important that we understand what it is that we're looking for in the mouth of a patient during the abdominal examination. The first thing we can do when we actually get the patient to open their mouth is have a look at the sides. We may see angular stomatitis, small breaks here, which can be due to vitamin B12 deficiency. Now, sometimes people have cold sores in the same location, and we differentiate those because the cold sores are due to a virus, and thus we get vesicles forming, um, which are not present if we have the angular stomatitis due to B12 deficiency. So there are major changes that can be seen on the tongue if we have vitamin B12 deficiency. So it can become sore, so a glossitis. It will become enlarged and it'll be red, almost a beefy coloration. And it can also be smooth because it'll lose the papilla on it. This could be seen in celiac disease or one of the inflammatory bowel diseases, for example. Interestingly enough, diabetics who take metformin can also be at risk of having low levels of B12 because of the absorptive problems they have as a result of taking the metformin tablets. Now, that's very much to point out. Metformin is a crucially important drug when it comes to diabetes, and B12, we can simply replace it with an over-the-counter vitamin pill, so it's not the end of the world. Similarly, some patients will also lack vitamin B12 in their diet, so it's a supplement that we can provide quite often. I've seen a lot of issues with B12. My sister has Crohn's disease, and when her levels are low, she's distinctly aware of it because her memory goes and she's more irritable than normal, and she has much more difficulty than would be usual um, holding a conversation. So there's clear you know, neurological benefits to making sure that if you've got any conditions that do potentially affect vitamin B12, you're taking supplements or if need be, getting um, a supplementation from your doctor. I've always remembered that it's B12 deficiency uh, that gives us this bright red glossitis because we've got all the Bs. It's big, it's bald, it's bright red with that beefy redness to the tongue. By comparison, we can have a glossitis seen with iron deficiency anemia. There we've got the flip side. We've still got the sore tongue and it can sometimes be smooth as well. But the whole tongue looks so much paler there because we're lacking the haemoglobin that gives our tissues that nice redness as it's infused with blood. 
And in both cases, if I'm seeing a patient with these changes to the tongue, I want to know why. What is the problem that's meaning they're not getting enough B12? Where, are they get, where is that iron going to? Or are they not eating enough? Or is it not being absorbed correctly? What's the issue here? And we have to remember that something we may see in one examination may relate to a different system. So, for example, in a female patient, their iron deficiency anemia could be due to heavy periods. So it's very important we don't blinker ourselves just because we think that we know what's going on with the system. It may be from somewhere else. As well as the tongue, inside the mouth we've got the teeth. We need to have a look to see if they've got good levels of dentition or not, because that may give us an idea about the patient's overall health. We want to have a look at their gums to see if there's any gingivitis, or perhaps if there's any bleeding that might indicate scurvy. Now, it sounds a bit crazy to say scurvy you know, in 2020, but there are some patients in the UK that have issues with their diet and don't get enough vitamin C, so we can't rule out what we previously considered to be old diseases. And slightly unpleasant for the uh, doctor, but very important clinically, we want to sniff the patient's breath. If a patient has problems with uh, liver failure, we may get this hepatic fetor, um, sort of a, a, it's described as a mousy smell, which I think is an odd description of its own right, but it's certainly not typical bad breath, it's, it's this sort of moist decay type smell. There is another smell that can be found on certain patients' breaths, that being ketones. This tends to be seen in diabetic ketoacidosis. Unfortunately, there's a, a small percentage of the population, myself included, can't smell this ketone or pear drop type smell. However, I'd hope that clinically, if I got a patient in DKA, I'd notice all the other issues wrong with the patient to tip me off that something was going on, rather than just having to rely on their breath smell. Finally, we also want to pay attention to see if there's any mouth ulcers. Those may be indicative of cancers, potentially. I've certainly seen uh, one patient who had a large ulcer on their tongue, which they'd been hoping would go away, which didn't, and unfortunately proved to be a cancer there, which has um, needed some radical treatment. Ulcers can just be bad luck. We all get them from time to time, but they can also indicate more significant pathology, such as Crohn's disease. If we're getting recurrent ulcers there, we might have to think, is there something deeper going on that we need to investigate? Carrying on from the mouth, we want to examine the lymph nodes of the head and neck, and particularly the axillaries as well. When it comes to the neck, we want to check on the left side um, for a supracavicular node, which we'll do by getting the patient to shrug their shoulders up and pressing deep down above the clavicle. You can try it on yourselves, it won't hurt, but you can be surprised, you can probably push at least a finger breadth down below your clavicle. On an abdominal examination, this is a vital um, sign to check for because it can indicate a GI malignancy. And I've never seen it, but we always teach about it. And a few weeks ago, one of uh, my students, um, Ollie, um, he came to me and said he thought that he'd seen a patient just who'd got uh, this uh, supracavicular lymph node, this Verkhaus node. And I'll be perfectly honest, it's quite normal for students to think that they've found weird and wonderful things. I know I certainly did it because you're not calibrated against normal at that time as a student. You're calibrated against the textbooks. You're always reading and seeing huge pathologies. And I didn't think that he'd found it. But nevertheless, I went to check. And I had to eat my own words because unfortunately, the chap there had a very prominent lymph node on this side. Uh, we're currently uh, going through the workup with that patient, but uh, uh, I'm very worried what's going to be found with that. In terms of Ollie, he actually has his own uh, YouTube channel dealing with life at Warwick Medical School. If you want to see how the medical school works from a student perspective, it might be worthwhile checking out one of his videos. You can see something there, I think. Having completed the head and neck examination, uh, we want to get the patient to disrobe. Now, by that, I mean removing their shirt. There are some textbooks, McLeod's particularly, uh, will say expose the uh, abdomen down to the top of the hips. I would disagree with that. I'd ask the patient to remove the t-shirt or shirt completely because I want to be able to have a look at the upper chest as well. 
One of the reasons being, we talked about palmar erythema with high estrogen state, states causing blood vessel proliferation. The same can happen on the body, and we can get spider nevi. Now these are very cool little um, venules um, that have um, a central venule that spreads out to these spider-like legs. And you know that you've got a spider nevi because you press on top of it and it will blanch, it'll disappear. And when you remove the pressure, it will fill up and out from the centre to those legs. Now, we know that uh, women have higher oestrogen levels anyway, so five spider nevi is normal in health for a lady. They can obviously have more subsequent to other pregnancies, but if there's more than five, I want to pay attention to it. And any more than five on a chap, and I'm definitely going to wonder what's going on with that. Again, having taken off um, the shirt, it allows us to assess if there's any gynecomastia, so increase in the breast tissue in a chap as an example, which again might make us think, is there a problem with the liver? Are we looking at a high oestrogen state here for some reason? Now, we also appreciate that that could be due to increased adipose tissue, but we're putting together all of these bits of information um, to work out what may or may not be going on with regard to our established differential diagnoses from the history. So we're trying to take the differential diagnoses that we arrived at from our history and take information to refute or confirm those differentials so we can say this is what is wrong with the patient. With the shirt off, we want to see if there's any surgical scars on the abdomen, which may indicate previous surgery. So, for example, common ones that we might be looking for would be an incision in the right iliac fossa, suggesting an appendicectomy. We may also have ports uh, visible on the abdomen, suggesting some form of laparoscopic surgery. They can be particularly subtle, so it is important to pay close attention there, particularly around the umbilicus, which if they've had surgery um, laparoscopically, would normally be used as a port because it's easy to hide it afterwards. Other changes that we may see on the abdomen relate to blood flow. We may have something called caput medusa, where we get blood vessels around and coming out from the umbilicus. This would be seen if we had portal hypertension, increased blood pressure in the vessels around the liver. We can have inferior vena cava obstruction, where something is blocking one of the main veins in the body, and unlike the caput medusa, which are coming out from the umbilicus, we may get dilated veins running on the surface of the abdomen generally. And we can determine where the source of the blockage is from the direction in which the flow is going. If we've got inferior vena cava obstruction, then those vessels are going to flow superiorly. Conversely, if we have the much rarer superior vena cava obstruction, they're going to flow inferiorly. And we can check that by pressing the blood vessel, moving along it, and releasing one hand, and seeing which way that the blood vessel does or does not fill up. Once we've done another overview of the patient, we actually need to get on with the whole pokey-pokey bit of the examination. So we get the patient to lie flat and have their hands beside them, because that will help relax the abdominal wall muscles. If the patient's not in any pain, we should have a flat abdomen or a concave abdomen. If, however, we notice that the abdomen is still distended, we might be thinking, is there fluid in the abdomen? Similarly, if it is asymmetrical, then we may be worried that there's a mass there. And what we've seen at this point is going to guide our examination, which will start off with palpation. We must make sure that we ask the patient, are there any areas of pain on the abdomen? And we will have to still examine that area, but that will be done last. So, for example, a patient with right iliac fossa pain, we may be worried it's an appendix, we're going to start off and go around the other nine regions before we get to the right iliac fossa. And our initial palpation, simply up and down, up and down, up and down, is using one hand, and it's very light. The only purpose of this initial palpation is to check for pain and tenderness. Whilst we're doing that superficial um, examination for tenderness, we need to keep an eye on the patient's face because that's going to tell us a lot as well about even mild levels of discomfort. And where the pain is can tell us a lot of information. So for example, if we have pain at McBurney's point, that could indicate appendicitis in any patient. If we've got pain in the right iliac fossa, the suprapubic region, the left iliac fossa, 
in a female patient, that patient is pregnant until proven otherwise because that can be such a catastrophic mistake if somebody misses an ectopic pregnancy. Subsequently, we're going to be able, we'll be using two hands and I like to push down and round, down and round as I'm doing this deeper palpation because now I'm trying to assess are there any masses, is there any organomegaly, is there anything enlarged here that shouldn't be that I can now feel and that down and round part helps me characterise anything that I may come across. If we do come across any um, masses or any areas where things feel denser, um, I want to be able to clarify on the site, on the shape of any masses, on the size of any masses, the surface of any masses, and are they fixed or are they mobile when we're pressing them. It's unlikely with an intra-abdominal mass we're going to be able to check for transillumination, but it's something to think about if this seems to be very superficial, but I think that would be highly unlikely. Consistency should also be checked. As an example, if we found impacted faeces, then that's going to feel much denser, but we are going to be able to leave indentations in that area with deep pressure, which wouldn't be possible, say for example, with a cancer. After we've done the light and deep palpation, we need to do some special um, examinations for both the spleen and the liver. In both cases, we're going to start off in the right iliac fossa, and we're going to examine with the leading border of our right hand going up with the patient breathing in and out to get to the costal margin. This will allow us to assess where the inferior edge of that organ is. So on the right iliac fossa, we press in deeply and it's breathe in, breathe out. As the patient breathes out, the liver moves up and that lets us move our hand again. We keep our hand in place as the patient breathes in because that will move the liver down. And we're going to keep going all the way until either we get to the costal margin or we encounter the edge of the liver. If we do encounter the liver edge earlier, we want to describe it in the number of finger breaths that we can feel below the costal margin. We can come across a very important sign when assessing the liver here, that being Murphy's sign. The patient takes a deep breath in when we're at the costal margin. As they breathe in, the liver comes down and the gallbladder contacts with our fingers and the patient gets a sudden increase in pain. This is suggestive of an infection, an inflammatory process in the gall, uh, gallbladder, probably um, a cholecystitis. There is, however, another similar issue. If we've examined the liver, the patient takes a deep breath in at the costal margin and we can feel the gallbladder coming down, or at least a mass, certainly, but no pain. This is Kavossia's sign. Now, that will probably be associated with a jaundice as well. And we change things ever so slightly now. We go from Kravossier's sign to Kravossier's law. Now, Kravossier was a very cautious chap, and he said a painless, palpable gallbladder in the presence of jaundice probably is not due to gallstones. What he's actually saying is there's something obstructing the outflow of uh, bile. We've got an extra hepatic obstruction. And unfortunately, more often than not, it is a pancreatic cancer that's causing the problem. However, the sign is not strong enough to be able to say that jaundice in the presence of a palpable, painless uh, gallbladder is pancreatitis. It's not strong enough to say that. Now, here you can decide on a bit of personal variation. We can complete the examination of the liver or we can do the palpation for the spleen. I like to do my palpations together. So having checked in the right hypochondrium, we're going to return to the right iliac fossa, now moving up to the left hypochondrium for the spleen. The reason that we examine from the right iliac fossa initially is because the liver enlarges toward the right iliac fossa. Similarly, the spleen enlarges towards the umbilicus. Now, I've actually been caught out by this as a medical student. I was asked to see a child who had sickle cell, and as a result, we wanted to know how big their spleen was. So I started off 
above the right iliac fossa and started to palpate. So I started off a little too high above the right iliac fossa and started to palpate up. And I turned to my consultant in a proud and happy voice and said, no, there is no splenic enlargement here. This child is good to go. Now, thankfully, the consultant had already assessed the patient because I was wrong. The poor child's spleen had enlarged all the way right down to the right iliac fossa. And because I'd started a little too high up, I'd actually missed the edge of the spleen. So I didn't find another edge all the way up because I was pressing on top of the spleen all the way. Once we've assessed the um, size of the spleen in terms of palpation, we need to confirm with percussion. Now we're going to start off in the mid-axillary line and percuss downwards. So we're going to get resonance, resonance, resonance until we get to about the 9th to 11th rib where we'd expect a dullness to take over, showing we've found the top border of the spleen. And that allows us to comment on the size. The same is true for the liver. Again, the mid-axillary border, percussing down. And here it's about the 10th, 11th rib, where we'd expect to find a dullness, and allowing us then to map out the size of the liver. Because we know where the liver edge is, having found it on palpation, we can now compare that with the superior border of the liver, which would be under the ribs. Now, to put all of that in perspective, particularly with regard to the child with that massive spleen, the spleen needs to enlarge by three times its normal volume before it becomes palpable. So in a normal patient, in a healthy patient, a patient that has no problems with them, you should not be finding a spleen palpable. If they are, you know that there is a problem and you need to go digging to find out what's going on. Now, the reason why I highlighted that there was a slight deviation with the percussion there, we've still got some palpation left to do. We need to press down either side of the umbilicus to find whether or not there is an expansile pulsatile mass, which may indicate the presence of a triple A. We can also palpate down to see if we can find the top end of the bladder. Once we're happy that these have been done, we also need to try and blot the kidneys. And not to disappoint people, but you're probably not going to be able to blot the kidneys in anybody other than a patient with the most massive um, polycystic kidneys. I have never once um, been able to palpate the kidneys because I haven't seen um, a patient with those massive kidneys before. But you're going to be pressing front and back, and the theory is you're trying to flip the kidney up so you can press it or feel it with your other hand keeping in mind that the kidneys are retroperitoneal. So there's quite a bit of movement required for that to happen. Hence, you're probably not going to come across anything unless the kidneys are significantly enlarged. Subsequently, we want to percuss around the abdomen. Ideally, we want to be doing this with the patient holding their breath in expiration, because that means that we're not going to be having the lungs compressing the abdominal contents. The straightforward Percussion around the abdomen hopefully won't reveal any particular dull areas where we're not expecting them. If so, we want to sort of compare that with the information we've got on the history. Is there a possibility the patient could be constipated as an example? If we're worried about an obstruction, then we're likely to find resonance before the obstruction, possibly some tenderness, and then dullness after the obstruction as the bowel there has collapsed. Now, when we did the abdominal examination demonstration, there was some question about where auscultation should come in the examination um, approach. Now, McLeod's, um, very importantly, lists auscultation as the last step. So we have a reference here, and most of the other textbooks in the UK also have that same position. Um, if, however, we look for a few references, we find that the auscultation is actually a very weak sign. A big um, example for where people feel auscultation is important is in bowel obstruction. And we're classically taught that the bowel will be obstructed, it will collapse um, after the obstruction, and before it we get um, expansion because nothing can pass through the bowel. And here, over this uh, dilated area, we're classically taught that people will hear tinkling bowel sounds. 
If you have a look at the literature, tinkling bow sounds are only present in about 25% of confirmed obstructions. Similarly, peritonitis should have absent bow sounds because the movement of the bow irritates the peritoneal lining and causes pain. Again, if you check the, um, uh, the literature, less than 50% of patients have that classical finding. And in addition to that, when you are listening for bowel sounds, to be absolutely correct, you listen to uh, one side of the umbilicus and you should listen for at least two minutes because it can be normal for a patient not to have bowel movements or bowel sounds for that entire period of time. Ultimately, the auscultation of the abdomen should be left until last after we've done the um, palpation and percussion. The reason being is it is a very poor diagnostic um, provider of information. So we want to be able to take the information we've found so far and consider it in the light of auscultation findings. However, because those auscultation findings are very poor, if, for example, we didn't have um, uh, tinkling bow sounds, that should not dissuade us from all the other information we have that supports the potential for bowel obstruction that we'd have picked up already in the examination. Whereas it's possible, if you were to do the auscultation first, that you may begin to think for alternative differentials and get lost in the woods because of you've said, well, no, I haven't got tinkling bowel sounds, this patient can't have that, where actually we know that's the case. I do appreciate that there's an argument to be made that doing palpation and doing percussion first may change the nature of the bowel sounds that you're hearing, but as mentioned, that's such a poor diagnostic uh, sign, that change I don't think is going to impact clinically on the patient. So as mentioned, the auscultation is done to the uh, one side of the umbilicus for about two minutes, and we're going to make sure we're doing that with the diaphragm of the stethoscope. Whilst there, we also want to be listening above the umbilicus to see if there are any arterial bruits that we may be associating with um, uh, you know, the AAA that we may or not have been able to feel. Again, ultrasound is very good at picking up AAAs, and it's surprising how many have not been seen earlier on examination which is why in the UK we now have screening available for men so that they could be checked with an ultrasound to see if there's any signs of a AAA before it becomes clinically detectable. We'd also want to check on the other side of the umbilicus to see if we could hear any renal artery uh, turbulent blood flow or bruise suggesting there may be any narrowing of those very important uh, blood vessels. Now, whilst I do use McLeod's as uh, my baseline, um, I don't always agree with everything in there. Um, and there is one examination technique that they suggest called checking for a succussion splash. That essentially means that if we're concerned that the patient may have ascites, so we've got a very large distended abdomen, we vigorously roll the patient from side to side to hear with our stethoscope if we can hear a succussion splash of the fluid moving around inside. I don't know about yourselves, but I think that sounds particularly cruel to a patient, so uh, that's not one that I like to um, perform. I do, however, have a big um, soft spot for checking for shifting dullness to show whether or not a patient has ascites. Now, ascites um, is said to be present once there's about 50 mils of fluid in the abdomen, although clinically you're not going to be able to detect that. Clinically, there needs to be at least a litre, a litre and a half of fluid floating around uh, in the abdominal cavity uh, before we can detect that with um, shifting dullness. So how do we do that? Well, we have the patient to lie on their back and we start to percuss at their umbilicus and we percuss around at the umbilicus, we'd expect to have resonance because the bowel is floating on the acidic fluid. And we're going to percuss down around the side. And when we reach the fluid, we would find dullness because fluid doesn't resonate. At this point, we get the patient to roll over on their side carefully because, as I say, I'm not a great fan of the succussion splash, so I want to make sure this is done with care. And wait for 
about 30 seconds to a minute. This allows the fluid to percolate down and the bowel to float up to this top area. We now percuss again and the area which was dull should now be resonant. And we keep palpating round back to the umbilicus which was previously resonant and is now dull. We have demonstrated shifting dullness. Simple really. Now because of the vast range of possible causes of ascites, um, liver failure being the most common, but obviously there can be things such as cancers as well that may be the issue. Infections similarly can cause fluid to build up in the peritoneal cavity. We need to get a sample of this fluid. We need to do an acidic tap in order to find out what makes up that fluid. And broadly, there's two main uh, ways of characterizing that fluid. Is it a transudate or is it an exudate? With a transudate, there's very low levels of protein in um, the fluid there, and that's going to be suggestive of a, a pressure-related issue, perhaps, as mentioned, portal hypertension due to liver failure. Conversely, if we've got an exudate, a high protein state, that's going to be much more concerning. That's going to be suggesting, you know, infections, is there a malignancy somewhere? We certainly need to find out the cause behind that. So we're going to finish the core part of the examination by going down to the patient's legs and we're going to check on the medial side of the tibia, pressing with three fingers just so that we get whiteness to the fingertips. This is showing 10 millimetres of mercury of pressure and that indicates that we know we're going to have enough pressure there to displace any fluid, any peripheral edema that may be present in the ankle. And if there is, it's going to make us think what's causing this. Again, we're thinking liver failures, low protein states, things such as that. There are some additional special tests that may need to be performed on an abdominal examination. One of which is checking for any hernias. So there we get the patient to stand up, we get them to turn away from you, and it's important even before COVID, cough as we're feeling over the inguinal hernial orifices and to see if there is a cough impulse suggesting that we have the presence of a hernia there. We were going to want to do the same over the uh, femoral triangle as well to see if there's a hernia present there. If we have found a hernia, we want to see if it is reducible or not. To complete an abdominal examination, and a hernia examination for that matter, we're going to need to check the external genitalia on a chap to see if any of that hernia is actually sat in the scrotum. We may also need to do, if indicated, a digital rectal examination. Note, it's not a PR, that is per rectum and is a direct route of how you give medication. The DRE is the digital rectal examination and this is a method of, well, as it says in the, uh, as it says in the acronym, examination, finding out extra information. And there's a video down there for you to check on how to perform the DRE. If a hernia is found, then we want to characterise it, looking at the position of the pubic tubercle and the inguinal ligament, so we can comment, is it a direct or an indirect hernia? And that's going to be quite important for sorting out the repairs. Also, is that hernia reducible? If it's not, then that patient needs to be seen in the A&E department by the surgical team straight away to decide whether or not they're going to operate um, to ensure there's no strangulation of that hernia. To wrap up, we want to go over the final bedside test. So that will be checking a urine dip, assessing uh, any stool samples in the lab, reviewing any existing abdominal x-ray films, and also checking the patient's weight. Because say, for example, we have ascites, that weight can increase quite rapidly. So we're going to want to keep a close eye on it. And similarly, when we're treating the patient, we want to make sure that we're monitoring how quickly or not preferably, their weight is coming off with regard to the fluid and ascites. The most important thing, as far as I'm concerned, in the abdominal examination of a female patient is a pregnancy test. If a patient of reproductive age has abdominal pain, they have an ectopic pregnancy until proven otherwise. It's one of the cardinal things for safe medicine and should not be obscured, should not be forgotten, and should not be overlooked in any way, shape or form. 
essentially an ectopic pregnancy can kill very quickly. So I have a practically a zero threshold for checking a pregnancy test on the urine dip of a lady of childbearing age. With that completed, we're going to thank the patient, let them get dressed and field any questions that they may have had. Well, I hope that's been good for yourselves. Um, I will tot up the, uh, the people who have given positive answers um, in our premiere here and uh, we'll contact someone to see who's won the copy of McLeod's. Um, if this has been useful to yourself, please um, consider liking the video, um, give us a comment about how we could improve things and click the subscribe button down below. You'd make me a very happy man because we're nearly at 50,000. Okay, take care, thanks very much and I'll see you soon. Cheerio.